Hey everyone, my name is Roisin. My channel is Rose Keats because Roisin is the Irish version of Rose. And in 2023, I am doing a no-buy year. Today's video is about reflecting on the why I am doing a no-buy year. This is not my first no-buy year, so the first part of the video is really going to be me going through the last five years, basically, 2018, 19, 2020, 2021 and 2022, looking at the different projects that I have done around consumption and trying to reduce my consumption in those years, reflecting now with a bit of distance on what has worked or not worked about those years and reflecting on why it has brought me to doing another no-buy year in 2023. I would absolutely love to have you along on my 2023 journey, so if you're not already subscribed and you are also looking to try and reduce your consumerism, to reevaluate your relationship with stuff, to want less, to appreciate what you have, to spend a bit less money, which I think is going to be a major reason for a lot of people in 2023 to be evaluating their relationship with stuff. So whether you're doing a no-buy year, whether you're doing a low-buy year, whether you're just trying to be a bit more mindful, I would love to have you subscribe and come along with me this year and be part of a team that we can support one another. I would just love to have a little bit of community because I think if you're doing a challenge like this, and it is a challenge if you're somebody who loves frivolous things that are not essential and possibly spends a little too much money and places a little too much importance, on those things, it is a challenge to distance yourself from them in that way. So it is hard and I think that is so much easier undertaken as part of a group. I absolutely love getting comments and messages and things. It makes me feel less alone so I would love to have you subscribe and come along and be part of that with us. Because it is a challenge doing an by year and the going does get tough at times, it really, really does. Having a community is one side of that, you know, having other people you can check in with or click into or, you know, like content on YouTube that you can consume that is supportive of the mindset that you're in, that is not promoting mindless consumption, that is one side of it. But the real core thing that will keep you going, that will, that has to become the like ball of iron in your core for when those testing times happen is knowing why. Why are you doing it? Why have you signed up to this? Why are you putting yourself through it? What are you hoping to achieve? And that why has to be stronger than the pull to buy things and spend money on things that, you know, are beautiful, that are trying things that you will want things that you know for me certainly I would attribute so many qualities to the fantasy of owning I would see things I say I would I still do I still see things and want them and I picture myself you know wearing it or using it and I imbue these things with these magical qualities of how my whole life is going to get so much better because I own X item now First and foremost, that doesn't happen. You know, that that is something, that is a mindset that I used to get into and would convince myself was absolutely true. And when I was shopping in a really problematic way, in a way that was informed by me having very poor mental health in 2016 and 17 in particular, I was absolutely convinced that I could one day buy my way into feeling better. I could finally find the right dress, the right pair of shoes, the right lipstick, whatever it was, was going to fix everything that I didn't like about my life. And when I would fixate on something like that, I would imbue it with all these properties and I would covet it and I would want it and then I would buy it and then it wouldn't fix my life. And I would discard it and rather than, you know, confront the fact that clearly no physical thing that I could buy was going to fix the way that I felt, I would be like, it's the fault of that item, that just wasn't expensive enough, it wasn't shiny enough, it wasn't high-end enough, it wasn't covetable enough, there's something better and when I get that something better, I will feel better and I would spend then time and energy identifying and researching that something better, you know, like a MAC lipstick wasn't cutting it so maybe, you know, 
a Dior one would or a Chanel one would and when those didn't maybe it was a Tom Ford one and you know it just went up and up and up and I never actually confronted that none of those things was ever going to fix my life so that is one side of that that is that problem in extreme I am in so much like I'm a million miles away from who I was before I started my first ever no buy in 2018. I am really proud of that when I actually look back and I look at where I started and where I am now. I'm obviously always evolving, nobody's ever fixed for want of a better phrase. You know, we're never completely free of it, but I know I'm in a much, much, much better place than I was, both in terms of my consumerism and my mental health and the way that those went hand in hand but that doesn't mean that I don't still have the less extreme version of that fantasy when I see something and I imagine me wearing it and I now have the distance between buying things and owning them and coveting them and imagining my life with them to know that no single item is going to come in and change my life like yes like I think it is worth acknowledging that wearing something that you feel really good in and you know presenting yourself well does make you feel better than turning up in you know something that's really worn out and old and whatever and I that's something we're going to talk about in this video so I do think things have a power but it's it's acknowledging that that power is limited and it's not going to change your life if you're in that extreme sense of overspending but it doesn't ever go away you still have that fantasy or I still have that fantasy even though it's now not a fantasy that is fueled by the grip of ill health it's still a fantasy and it still happens and it can still be quite overwhelming so your why why you're on an obi why you're trying to change your habit that has to outweigh that fantasy it doesn't necessarily have to in the moment because sometimes you need the moment but you need to be able to have the moment and then step back, connect with your why, and have that why overpower the power of that moment. I hope that makes sense. So as somebody who is a million miles away from where she was at her worst, the why and identifying your why is incredibly important to success in this challenge. Your why has to be strong enough that it will outweigh your desire for stuff. So to go through my history, in 2018 and 2019 I did a beauty no buy year and I thought when I did it in 2018 that I was going to do one and it would be fine and I would be really in control of my collection after that and then realised very swiftly that that wasn't the case and did it again in 2019. And the reason for that, my why on those years was that when I was in the real grips of bad mental health spending in 2016 and 17, a lot of that focused on beauty stuff. I think, you know, speaking personally, it was because I had body image issues and I did not want to be trying clothes on. Like I didn't want that cycle of like loving a dress, ordering it, getting it and then hating how it looked on me. Like. I almost think it was like self-preservation. I was in such a bad place anyway that I think if I had been putting myself through that, I don't even want to think about where I would have ended up. So I think it was, I didn't want to look at my body. I didn't want to consider my body. So clothing did not become a focus. So in 2018 and 19, when I went on those beauty no buy years, it was because my beauty stuff had just exploded in terms of quantity because I had been buying all this stuff at an alarming rate and then not using it. So I felt really overwhelmed by how much stuff I had and that was my why in 2018 and 19. And the thing was, I think as 2018 and 19 happened, I was in a much better place mentally and I maybe actually came out of my body issues a little bit and started buying more clothing, shoes, etc. It kind of meant that I hit 2020 and what I was realising by 2020 was that my beauty collection was so out of control that two years of doing a no buy and doing project planning had not actually reduced it to anything manageable. So I was feeling even more overwhelmed at the start of 2020 by how little impact two years of not buying anything had actually had because my collection had been so big 
to start with. I think as well the other thing that is maybe worth acknowledging here is that I graduated in 2015, so 2016 and 17 were my first years like on a graduate programme in, in a career in the real world outside of uni and as well as the fact that my mental health was not great, the thing that has also, that has continued now is as somebody who works full time, I don't play with makeup the way that I once might have done when I was in high school and in uni and studying because that was my idea of a good time like I would get ready for a night out and I would really enjoy the getting ready process or like if I had a day off I would sit with like a YouTube tutorial and I would follow it and I would just play about with my collection whereas I didn't really have the time to do that once I started working full time also didn't really have the energy through 2016 and 17 to go on like I barely had the energy to shower in those years never mind go on nights out and even now, like, I do like a night out every so often, whatever, and I still enjoy the getting ready process, but it's not like, you know, the way it was when we were at uni and we were out every, like, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I was never, so I had, A, accumulated all this stuff, and B, decreased the, the amount of time that I was using it, putting aside even not using it because I was in a really bad headspace for two years, even now my makeup usage is so drastically decreased from where it was when I was at school just because of time. That has to be taken into account. So there had been a lifestyle switch there as well, which I hadn't really anticipated, which I hadn't thought about how that was going to impact on my usage of makeup. And I kept purchasing. And then in 2018 and 19, I sort of expected my usage to go back to what it had been before I had started working full time. When I had had more free time, when I had been going out more, when I had been, you know, having days off where I could sort of experiment with like more sort of fun out there looks in a way that I was never gonna put that face, kind of face on to go to an office environment. So there had been a lifestyle switch which I hadn't really accounted for. So in 2020, I was feeling really disheartened by the fact that two, two years hadn't really impacted enough. I was feeling still really overwhelmed by the beauty stuff and I was starting to feel quite overwhelmed by the clothing and things. Because I had just started working full time in 2016, I had more disposable income than I'd ever had, obviously having been a student before then. And when I stopped buying beauty stuff, I was still spending the same money, well actually I wasn't, I was spending much less money because, and what this is one of the things I've said in the past, is that I have never been kind of motivated by money with doing this or by debt, which I know so many people who go down this route, they do come to it from that and that's kind of hanging over them and that's pushing them. That was never my why before this year. We're obviously going to get on to talking about money later, but that had never been the issue for me. It hadn't really been about the amount of money that I was spending because I also at that point wasn't really thinking about the fact that I might be buying a house as a single person in a few years time, I was in a relationship, I presumed, you know, I was letting what I kind of thought was going to happen in my life be dictated by this other person and the, some of the choices they were making, which, anyway, there's no point getting into that. But basically, I was in a different financial position and I had a lot more disposable income and I was, a, I was much happier spending that disposable income but it just meant that that disposable income went from being on makeup to being on clothes and shoes. So in 2020, I was really overwhelmed by everything. I was really disheartened by the fact I had done this like really difficult two years of not buying things and not going along with the hype and sort of distancing myself from, I don't want to say distancing myself from the beauty community, like that's maybe not, quite the right way to put it but distancing myself from the consumerism and having going through that FOMO because it is a challenge doing a no buy and the FOMO is part of that and when you have been somebody who has been at the forefront of always buying it, it, that had become part of my personality I think as well and that was part of also my why in 2020 was because friends or family members who wanted to ask about beauty products they'd ask me and I was, and it, I kind of had to take this moment of being like, I'm not a full-time YouTuber. I am not like, you know, making hundreds of thousands of pounds every 
other month is an influencer like I am just somebody who's enthusiastic about this but my knowledge and my amount of stuff that I had and how on the cutting edge of stuff that I sort of felt I had to be that got taken away and that was like losing part of my personality in 2018 and 19 when I went through my first two no buy years so that that was really really difficult ultimately I didn't like it because it's not a very interesting part of a personality particularly when there are people who do that as a job who are being paid to do that like if I want to know about a uh, vitamin C for example there are people like Sally Hughes and Nadine Baggett and Alessandra Steiner and various other beauty journalists who that is their job and they are reporting back in that they are being paid for it they are being given the product free of charge I was paying for all my product I was not being paid to have this like super informed opinion at all times and I kind of had to get to a point where I was like I don't want this to be something that is a trademark of my personality is she always knows what's going on she's always bought the latest thing like that's not an interesting thing to be able to say about yourself so that was part of my why as well going into 2020 I was overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that I had. I kind of had gone through this like loss of a part of my personality in 2018 and 19 that I still was feeling. I had kind of gone through the feelings of it, but then I'd also kind of decided I don't want that part of my personality back. I don't, you know, I've, I've lost it and I've gone through the sort of grieving process almost of that, but I don't want it back. I want to find new stuff. And part of finding new stuff and you know identifying other things that I could be interested in that I could be giving more time to was taking time off of how much time I spent shopping because even though I wasn't researching beauty stuff in quite the same way and I wasn't maybe consuming the beauty content that I was I was still spending far too much time scrolling on the internet looking at things reading handbag forums celebrity best dress lists and figuring out what I liked and didn't like and and I still like all of that, so I still like fashion and beauty. So it's not, it has never been about stopping that altogether for me. But that was part of my why was the time. So in 2020, it was overwhelmed with stuff, looking to open up more time in my life that I could put in to more useful hobbies, to hobbies that I either could just develop and enjoy for the sake of them on their own, or hobbies that I could hopefully and would still like to, something I've still not done, but would like to develop to a point that I could monetize them at a point in the future. I know that's a bit vague, but I know what I'm talking about. But that was my big why in 2020 was just, it was overwhelming still and it was time and it was the amount of mental energy that I was putting in to accumulating stuff, to researching stuff. So that was what was driving me through those first three years. And those first three years overall went very very well so I have definitely found I am somebody for who a clear cut no buy a clear cut the answer is no I cannot purchase it that works much better for me than trying to moderate it I'm not somebody who moderates very well in any area of my life like I just if I'm gonna do something I am like going for it I am fulfilling the brief 110% saying absolutely not I'm not buying anything that's easier for me than saying I'm only spending 50 pounds or whatever because as soon as I've spent that 50 the the you know the want is still there and I'm like oh I could just just an extra whatever is not gonna hurt and then once I'm over it I'm like well I'm over it so I may as well just go right over it you know I am definitely an all or nothing person and the no buy absolutely works more easily for me because of that but in 2021 I knew I wanted to reintroduce shopping and spending because it is something that I enjoy as much as I was spending more time than I was comfortable on it I didn't want to go from spending more time than I was comfortable on it to spending no time on it it was just about finding that sweet spot of being involved enough with something to be enjoying it without making it my personality and without giving my entire life over to it. So I did want to reintroduce shopping and spending and what I did in 2021 was I did a quantity controlled low buy. So I called it my year of one and I allowed myself to buy one thing each month. Quantity I think was much easier for me 
than budget. We'll, we'll talk about budget. It worked. I bought one thing per month and my exception was that on holidays I could buy one thing per day. In 2020, to backtrack a little bit, I'd had the exception that I could buy what I wanted on holiday and I was also allowed to buy myself a birthday gift and a Christmas gift. However, 2020 was when the pandemic hit. So I ended up not going on any holidays. So I actually ended up basically not taking advantage of my exceptions because we didn't get to go on holiday, didn't get to travel. So that was what it was. 2021, my rule of one, my quantity of one was one thing per month. And then for holidays, I could buy one thing a day on holiday. Now, as much as 2021 went really well in terms of the quantity aspect, what happened was I spent a lot of money. I entered 2021 having come off a no buy year in 2020, which had also been a pandemic year. So I had stopped buying stuff. So that, you know, money going out because I was buying stuff stopped. So that money started coming up again. But also I wasn't going on holiday. So I didn't spend any money paying for holidays, didn't spend any money on holiday, you know, didn't spend any money buying clothes to go on holiday, didn't need spending money for holidays. The entire economy of how much of my money I spend on holidays, which I've very much taken last year, has like been massively eye-opening for me on that. All that money I was spending on travel stopped. So all of that budget came back up. And also we didn't go anywhere. So I didn't socialise. I wasn't going to the theatre. Like I wasn't going on day trips. I wasn't going out for dinner. All of that stopped. So I entered 2021 and I could absolutely kick myself now because the economy is in such a different place in 2023 from how it was in 2021. But I entered 2021 in a very, very good financial position. So when I went on my quantity control blow by, I bought things and I still, like, I am saying this, I still love everything I bought that year. I had a ball in 2021 because I bought things that I would never have usually been able to justify buying because I had stopped for a full year, so I had brought all my money up, but what I hadn't really made the connection of was the holidays, that's what we're going to come back to when we talk about last year, but I had just convinced myself I had all this money because I hadn't been buying stuff. I, I didn't really appreciate that actually I had all this money because I hadn't been buying stuff and hadn't been doing things, and rather than, you know, putting it all into an ISA or something, which would have been sensible, I spent it. And I, as I say, I love what I bought, but I spent a lot of money in 2021. I spent an amount of money in 2021 that would not be feasible for me to spend on an average year. And part of that as well was because in 2021, although travel opened up a little bit, like I didn't go any big holidays in 2021. So every year basically from sort of 2010 onwards, prior to the pandemic, I had been on at least two big holidays a year. So I was pretty much going to Florida and New York, like at least every year I was doing one of those big holidays. And then generally if I did one big holiday, I would do like a couple of trips to London and a couple of trips to like Disneyland Paris, maybe a European break or whatever. Or if I did two of those holidays, I would do two of those holidays and then go to London and maybe Paris or whatever, like on smaller holidays as well. So I was spending a lot of money on holidays and on travel. And I was really, I was into the habit of that. So I was almost into the habit of, well, I wasn't almost into the habit of, I was in the habit of, I had a direct debit that at the start of every month, I would get paid and it would go into my holiday account in the way that most people would have a savings account or whatever. I had a holiday savings account. I do have a normal savings account as well, but my holiday savings just went off automatically. And in 2021, I still we still weren't in a point where we were going on holidays again because things were still iffy, like things were kicking back off and settling back down. I didn't feel confident enough to start booking big holidays again. So that holiday savings account was looking pretty robust as well as just my normal bank account looking robust. So that got absolutely emptied in 2021, which I can't, I, looking at it now, I'm like, how stupid was that? But I was like, oh, well, I mean, it's not like it's my actual savings account. It's 
my fun savings account and this is fun. So I bought a whole load of really expensive things and I love them and I don't want to sell any of them, I don't want to give any of them away, but I spent a lot of money. And I also didn't buy very practical things. As well as them being things that cost a lot of money, it was things that I really wanted that probably, if, I were, if we're being brutally honest, fit my fantasy life rather than my real life. Which leads me to 2022. After I spent a lot of money in 2021, in 2022 I went in another no bad year. And what I did was I employed the exact same setup that I had had in 2020, which was that I could have an exception that I could buy things on holiday freely because I'd had that in 2020 and it had worked. But I didn't seem to make the connection that had worked because I didn't go on holiday in 2020. And I went on quite a lot of holidays in 2022. I still didn't do any big, big holidays in 2022. I was meant to be going to New York at the end of the year and then for various reasons didn't go. But 2022 I went on quite a lot of holidays. So not big holidays like I had been doing prior to Covid, but quite a lot of holidays. Which meant that in 2022 I did a lot of shopping whilst still being within the rules of my no buy. But I bought more in 2022 than I did in the whole of 2021. Because I bought it in little dribs and drabs on holidays, I actually didn't really realise until I pulled it all together to film a haul video. I think kind of around maybe September time last year. I didn't really realise until it was all together how much I had bought. And I think it was it was quite scary for me to think, I've been on such a journey here. I've done a no buy, complete no buy in 2020 as well as beauty no buys in 2018 and 19. So I had stopped shopping for quite a long time. Then I did this very strict quantity control low buy in 2021. And then in 2022, I bought more stuff than I had bought when I was on a low buy whilst I was having a no buy year because I was allowing myself this holiday exception. And I think because I was stopping in between holidays as well, it didn't, it, it never kind of registered with me that it was maybe becoming a habit again. But then when I gathered it all up and I did give myself a bit of a fright about how easily I had accumulated all of that stuff without ever feeling like the way I was shopping was problematic. And I do have to say, I did get a fright in that video, so I, I will link it up and if you want to go watch it, you can go watch it. And I think you can see how shaken I am in that video. But the thing is, it was a big shock, but it was nothing compared to how I used to shop pre no buy. So it wasn't that problematic. Once I kind of calmed down and took a bit of a step back, it wasn't hugely problematic. It was a level of stuff that would be maintainable for me and it was a level of expenditure that would be maintainable as well as quantity. So overall, like, I wasn't absolutely distressed by it, but I was shocked by it. But at the point that I filmed that video, I had two more holidays planned that year and I said, I'm not going to change the rule. And I did get a comment on that video, which was saying, if you've realised this is a problem, why are you not changing the rule now? And to be honest, the answer to that lies in the fact that in 2021 I didn't buy very many practical things because I have worn a lot of stuff out and that actually was very much in my mind in 2022. I was quite strict with myself about the replacement rules so I have always been allowed replacements within my no buy but I think that's so much easier when it's I finished a cleanser and clearly it is empty and there is no more cleanser to use therefore I need to replace it. When you've kind of worn out a piece of clothing, until it gets to such times as it has so many holes in it that it has fallen apart and is absolutely no longer wearable, it's quite hard to say this jumper's kind of lost its shape because it's now been washed and worn so many times. Or, you know, there's a bit of staining under the arms on this thing now because of how many times I put it on to go to work in the morning and I've probably still got wet deodorant on and then you know probably sweat during the day and whatever in it you know it's maybe had its day or you know like my pyjamas for a riot it was just as well as single for most of the last few years because nobody should have to have seen the pyjamas I was sleeping in like they actually did have holes in them 
but I was like, oh well, nobody's seeing them, so I'll keep going. I really did get to a point where I had worn out a lot of my wardrobe, but in 2021, I hadn't really replaced any of my basics when I was doing my low buy. And I didn't really, I've never really felt 100% comfortable buying wardrobe replacements under my replacements rule because I look at my wardrobe and my wardrobe is bursting at the seams. It is huge. I have so many clothes and I love clothes, but I have so many like beautiful dresses when what I do is I wear jeans and a jumper to work most days. So I'll wear out those jumpers. My jeans I actually have replaced because generally I wear them until my thighs eat them and there's massive holes. But that's a bit more clear because it's like, right, these are no longer fit to wear. I cannot keep wearing these. It's not appropriate to turn up to work with, you know, massive holes in the thighs of my jeans. So I will put them in the textile recycling and buy a new pair. But it's much more difficult when things are just worn out, but they've not gone wholly. Do you know what I mean? To identify that and to justify that and for it to be quite as clear a one in, one out. And I've also found it quite difficult to justify it because... <sighs> I could get rid of a jumper that I wear to work. I know I've now got a gap because I really need to replace that jumper because I wear that jumper, you know, generally every week to work or whatever. But it feels ridiculous to replace that jumper that I would wear to work when I have got, you know, nice tops hanging in my wardrobe, even though I don't wear those nice tops to work. And it's a bit like to go back to the skincare and the beauty. If the jumpers that I wear to work are cleansers and the tops wear serums, I wouldn't finish my cleanser and say I'm not replacing my cleanser because I've got a vitamin C serum. You know, and even within my serums, like, I will say, like, if I finish my vitamin C serum, I can buy another one. It doesn't matter that I have a glycolic acid serum there because it's doing a different job. And that's, it's much easier to categorise those things. Whereas my wardrobe, it just feels a bit more, even though technically, like, workwear would probably be a different category from party wear, it's not quite as defined in that easy, clear way that skincare products are or beauty products in general are. You know, like a heat protectant spray and a shampoo are different or a lipstick and a blusher or, well actually you could use lipstick as blusher, but lipstick and mascara then say are very different. It's harder to pull that line with clothing and therefore I have not replaced a lot of clothing, even though I could buy replacements under the rules of my no buy, if I was genuinely out of something, I could replace it. I've not really done that. So what I was very aware of was that possibly the holidays that I was going on at the end of the year, which were to Dublin and to London, were going to be an opportunity for me to purchase things that I could wear to work. Because the thing is, so I hadn't bought anything in 2020. I hadn't really replaced anything in 2021. Although I'm saying it's difficult when you're wearing things out, there were things I had gotten rid of because they'd become so worn out. But say for example I got rid of a jumper that I would wear to work because it did have a hole in the seam, I'd be like, oh I have another three jumpers or whatever, it's fine, I don't need to replace it. But then what happens is if you have less stuff to start with, you're wearing them all more frequently on rotation. So if I had 10 work jumpers and I'm wearing them every day, each one is getting worn and I'm working five days a week, once a fortnight, so twice a month, 12 months a year. So see, each jumper then is getting worn 24 times in a year if I wear exactly the same, you know, things on two week rotations with these 10 jumpers, theoretically. But if I am getting rid of those jumpers and I go down from having 10 to having five, suddenly everything's getting worn once a week, so four times in a month, so 48 times in a year. So in a year then, I've achieved the same amount of uses as I would have had in two years previously. So things get worn out more quickly, the less you have of them. So over the last few years, I have had a dwindling amount of stuff because I've been getting rid of stuff, not replacing it because I haven't really been able to justify it, but really, really getting to a point where some of my things are a bit of a state, to the point my gran bought me some stuff for Christmas and was like, I thought you could get rid of some of those horrible jumpers you've still got, like, you know, it's, to the point it's being noticed by other people and I maybe don't have the distance to judge it properly. So that was part of it, was that I want, I knew I kind of needed stuff but I didn't really feel comfortable buying it as a replacement, so buying it on holiday felt a bit more like I wasn't breaking my rules but I would 
be getting what I needed. I think as well it's maybe worth noting that even though I'm talking about workwear, I probably have reduced my basics even more than I would have done because of the pandemic in 2020 and I, I'm sure a lot of you will be in the same position where you just you weren't getting dressed to go meet friends for lunch or whatever at the weekend so you were working from home through the week for most people and you know still wearing more casual clothes at the weekend maybe than you would wear if you were going to get dressed to go and socialise so all of those things got more wear than they would have done in a standard year. Does that make sense? I really hope that makes sense. But anyway, we've been talking about this for ages now, so let's move on. So that was partly why I didn't change the rule. But whilst we're on the subject of replacements, I did a beauty haul in November, I think, and I was talking about some of the replacements, and everything I bought in that beauty haul, and everything I showed in that beauty haul, the stuff I had spent money on was replacements. It was one in, one out, I'd used something up, this is what I'd replaced it with. And then I got things that I had got as gifts. So that was what made up that haul. And I got a comment on that video, which actually has now been deleted, possibly because the person took the time to reflect on it. Um, but it, it was quite a rude comment and it was just telling me that, um, you know, my replacements are such a problem, was the exact phrase used. And basically that I wasn't allowed to say I was on a no buy if I was buying replacements. As somebody who has been on a bit of a journey with this and done low buys, no buys and whatever. The no buy police do not exist. Your no buy has to suit you. So if you want to be somebody who is really wanting to go super minimal and you're wanting to go on a complete no buy and not replace anything that is superfluous to your view of essentialism, that is absolutely fine. Like more power to you, you go do that, like well done you. I am somebody who is probably always going to have things that might be seen as slightly superfluous by somebody who is in that very essentialism mindset. You know, for me, like one of the replacements I bought in that video was heat protectant for my hair. I can 100% understand that somebody who doesn't, who, you know, doesn't really care about the health of their hair or doesn't think that that's a priority in their life. I can see why that person would be like heat protected spray is a ridiculous product and I'm not buying it and I'm not spending money on it. For me, I I do, I like fashion and beauty and I, you know, to me heat protected spray is almost like a health product for my hair. So yes, I, I absolutely have my cynical moments where like I look at skincare and part of me is absolutely convinced it's a complete ruse and that we should all never have started and the best thing we could have done for our skin was just to leave it well enough alone because the human body is actually a bit of a miracle when you really think about how self-healing it is and the way it functions you know like I when you really get into it I'm just a bit like maybe the best thing would be to have never started with any skincare and just have let the body do its thing and take care of the skin itself and regenerate the skin the way that it does and whatever. So I have those moments and I get why some people are very committed to that that line of thought. I every so often go through little phases when I'm like quite convinced that's what I want to do. Ultimately I don't really know if I actually do want to commit to that line of thought to take the risk and like I mean even looking within my own family like I can look at my grandmother who looks really good for her age and has always used skincare and has always taken care of her skin and has always prioritised that in her life. And then I can look at her brothers who because they're male probably and of a certain generation of male for whom personal grooming really would not have extended to include skincare. And you, you know, there's, there's a big discrepancy in how they look. I'm just going to put it as, as politely as that. Now obviously there's other lifestyle factors that come into effect with your skin. You know, your diet affects it. If you work in a job where you're outside exposed to the elements, that affects it. You know, we've all, I'm sure, seen that image of that uh, van driver who's got like sun exposure on one side of their face and not on the other because of the side they drive the van on. And obviously all of that comes into play. Ultimately, I'm going to continue with my skincare. It's not that I don't think some of it's a bit of a joke but I'm not quite prepared to take the risk. So I am always going to be somebody who buys replacements and who has a beauty routine 
I have cut it down. I don't have as many steps in my routine as I did at one point. And I do think maybe that's something to consider on your no white is maybe when you finish something, don't replace it immediately. Maybe give it a week or a fortnight or even a month or whatever and see how your routine is without it. Absolutely would promote that. I have done that and I have eliminated certain products because of that. The no white place don't exist. There is not a set way to do a no white. If you are somebody who likes skincare and wants to buy replacements, do a replacements only no buy and it is fine. That is what you will get from me this year. That is what this will be. That is what I'll be talking about in my channel because to me in terms of like the clutter and the amount of stuff that I own and wanting to ultimately reduce that, the replacements are not the issue because they are staying at straight line. The issue is when, you know, I have, like I think at the moment, I did my skincare inventory um, a few weeks ago and I think I've got 39 face masks. Now, within that category, I'm never going to have one face mask because I'm probably always going to have like an exfoliating one, a brightening one, a clay one and a hydrating one, say off the top of my head, maybe a firming one actually. So it's never going to be a category that I only have one of because different things within that category will function differently. However, I don't want 39. That's too much. I'm not comfortable with that. I want to bring that down. So I'm not going to finish masks this year and then buy another one because I know I have other... If I have 39, I have alternatives to whatever one I've just finished. There'll be another one that does the same job within that stash because how could there not be if I have 39? Masks only have so many functions. I want that to come down. Whereas like I have one micellar water and one makeup cleansing balm so that's going to stay like that. If I finish that and buy another one, that's not growing and that's not the problem for me. The problem is categories that are growing, that are bigger than I want them to be, that need to be reduced. I'm not going to buy replacements in those categories, but I'm also never going to be a person without a skincare routine. So the replacements to me are not the issue. So I'm always going to buy replacements. And I think you, and your no buy has to suit you. It has to be doable for you. If like not having your skincare routine is going to make you absolutely miserable or you know whatever it is whatever your thing is that like taking that away would make you so miserable that it's not the misery you would experience from taking it away is more powerful than the why of why you're taking it away just have it take away the other stuff take away all the superfluous stuff don't buy replacement face masks but buy your cleanser do you, do you know what, whatever your equivalent is, make it workable for you because you have to still enjoy, yes it's a challenge and there are hard parts of doing a no buy and there will be really hard days and there will be days that it feels miserable and that's why we need the community so that's why we need to be commenting on each other's videos and you know sending DMs on Instagram and all of that like I'm so here for that. If you want somebody to unload too when you're like really struggling you know, send me a DM. I'm terrible at social media, so I'm saying that. You might not get an answer for about a week because I won't open Instagram for a week, but, like, create the community. I will come back to you. Or, like, comment it down below and somebody else might come back to you. Like, there are really challenging moments and you need that community within that, but also you don't need to create challenges that don't feel necessary to you to achieve what you want to achieve to fit somebody else's idea of a no buy. If somebody else is a complete minimalist and is like an essentialist, I would say more than, because I think minimalism has taken on a different meaning on the internet from what it actually is. Because in theory, there's a definition of minimalism that I that is one owns nothing that is not beautiful nor useful. I would love to be that version of a minimalist. I want everything I own to either serve a purpose you know, like a skincare item, for example, or to be beautiful, you know, whether it's an ornament, whether it's a red lipstick, whether it's a green dress, like, whatever it is, whether I'm using it or enjoying it, I want that. I don't want things in my life that are serving no purpose and not bringing me any joy either. So in theory, I could be a minimalist if we were going by that definition, but I am never going to be a minimalist in terms of what a minimalist on the internet looks like, which is everything white and not wearing any colour, 
and it's really ironic that I'm saying that because I'm wearing a black turtleneck which is very minimalist actually. But yeah, I like to experiment with style, with colour, with different looks. Like, you know, as much as I, I know I've said earlier in the video, I don't experiment as much as I used to when I was younger just because of time, just because I do work full time and whatever. I still like to play. I would be miserable if I wore jeans and a t-shirt and a blazer every single day. Like, I, I, no, absolutely not. That's never going to be me. If that's not you, you don't need to go on an Obi and declutter everything that you own that's colourful and only have a 12 item capsule wardrobe because it's somebody else's idea of what being a committed no buyer a reformed and excessive shopper looks like. It has to suit you. So really assess that with yourself. What is it you're aiming to achieve out the end of your no buy? And if it is to be a complete minimalist like that, like well done you, more power to you, I wish you all the best. But if it's to say I've got a collection of stuff that feels more manageable, that's great. Your version of manageable does not need to be somebody who can't function with the slightest bit of clutter and gets anxious if, you know, their hangers are a bit pushed together. As long as you're happy, that's the main thing. But anyway, to move on. So we've talked about replacements and how I will be buying replacements and how that's partly why I didn't change the rules for my no buy in 2022 when I realised I'd bought more. But the other two reasons are the things that I think will be my biggest challenges this year. And I think that's really useful is to identify to yourself almost in advance what what are going to be your really challenging moments and to think about them and to strategize for them before you actually face them. Just where you can not being caught unawares by that challenge can make such a difference to how you handle it versus if it comes on you when you don't expect it. I would say like that happened to me the first like 2018 in particular when I really as I say went through this like almost like grieving process of like thinking I'd lost part of my personality and and all because I had never done anything like that before and it was so so difficult so I know that like I'm making kind of identifications of challenges now in a different headspace to somebody who's maybe going in completely blind for the first time but it can even be identifying that like if it's going to be challenging for you to walk around Boots or walk around a department store, maybe don't make your Saturday plans with your friends to be to go do that. I really advocate for telling everybody that you're doing this because people who are your real friends will support you if you're like, this is a real goal for me and I'm really going to try and address it. Like, they will support you. So tell people that you're doing it and just say to them, look guys, I'm not in a position where I'm comfortable walking around the shops anymore at the moment like I know I'm just going to feel tempted I'm going to feel miserable can we do something else you know can we go for a walk in the park can we go for a coffee can we go for lunch can we go to the cinema like find activities to do that are not shopping I think that's like a really basic thing is if you're somebody who's trying to stop shopping stop putting yourself in a position where you're shopping or going to shops because pre no buy like I was going to the shops all the time so I was deliberately putting myself in the way of temptation and I know you can always do online shopping and that's definitely a temptation but if you are socialising mainly by wandering around the shops as a group suggest something else like that's one of the main like preemptive things I would say you might find a challenge is change the environment but anyway speaking of environment that is one of the things that is one of the first challenges that I think I'm going to face emotionally this year in terms of being tempted to break my no buy and that is because my job environment has changed. Now my job itself hasn't changed, I'm within the same role in my company and I'm in the same company but I used to be myself and my MD, my boss, who I work very closely with, the two of us used to be in what is essentially a branch of our company. However, things have been moved around and he and I have moved to head office. So when I was in the branch of my company, it's the construction industry that I work in. So there was, I was the only woman basically in the building. The guys that work in the actual construction bit of the industry were in sort of overalls and jeans because they're splashing oil about and they're, you know, in protective like um, you know safety weight and things like that so they weren't dressed for an office environment because I was in that branch I was like coming up and down stairs and 
you know, there was sometimes like mucky equipment lying about and whatever. So as I said earlier in this video, I would tend to wear jeans and a jumper to work. But now, because I'm moving to head office, there are a few other women in the environment and they're all wearing office wear, basically. And I don't really own office wear. So that is, you'll actually see when I do my London haul, there are a few things that I picked up in London that were kind of informed by me being like, when I go back in January, we're moving to head office and I'm going to need to dress a bit more office-like. Now, I'm still going to wear jeans and probably jumpers, but again, even being in that head office is making me really aware of how, like, worn out some of those jumpers are because, like, jeans and a jumper and a pair of, like, you know, reasonably smart shoes and whatever can still be quite a smart outfit. I do just feel that my work things need to be stepped up a little bit from what they have been for the past few years. Now I've decided to go in a no buy so I am obviously then saying I can't buy things for that but I feel like that's going to be one of my challenges is going to work and I think I'm going to have to combat that by and I, I think everyone should probably do this anyway but spending time in my wardrobe and trying different things that I maybe wouldn't have thought of as workwear before. Trying combinations of things and I think planning, you know, maybe on a Sunday night for the week ahead so that I am not getting up on like a Tuesday morning and I'm really stressed and I'm looking at my wardrobe and nothing that I've got is appropriate and I feel like I've got no clothes and then I just feel like I want to just go online and buy something so that I then know that that's something that I've bought specifically with it being work wear in mind and then would wear in that situation. I do think that is something I'm going to be quite aware of this year. It's not a replacement because it's bringing something new in but it would be bringing something in that I really do feel is a gap in my wardrobe but like I was saying earlier I've got a huge wardrobe so it feels inconceivable in a sense that there could possibly be gaps in a wardrobe that big and I think what I need to do is just spend some time with it and try and find some things that I can wear in the meantime. But I mean, I could genuinely see if I can get through to my birthday in July, I could see me in July being like, I need work wear for my birthday and sending my parents like a list of things to buy that I can wear to the office. I don't know exactly how I'm going to overcome it other than like, I did, I got a few things in London and my grand bought me a few things for Christmas that just because they're new are a bit smarter and whatever. So I think I'll be able to get through to my birthday and then possible solution could be asking for stuff for my birthday to wear to work, which feels a bit miserable to be asking for work wear for your birthday. But if you're on an all by year, that's, that's a possible solution to that kind of dilemma. But I do think that's going to be one of my dilemmas. And because I knew that that was coming up, that was another reason that I didn't change the rule in 2022 about holidays, because I then used those holidays to buy a handful of things that mean that I don't feel completely at sea going to head office now like I have a few things not a lot and because there isn't a lot of them they're probably going to get worn out more quickly as we've already discussed but yeah I do think that'll be a challenge for me this year. The second kind of temptation challenge is that the last time I was really freely buying clothing was 2019. So just in general my style has evolved in the last few years and I, I don't really know how to explain that because it's not like it's miraculously happened overnight and I would never have considered myself like a trend dresser or anything like that but I've just gotten that little bit older, you know, the things that I maybe feel um, most myself in now have changed and I've not really had the freedom to be bringing those things in. And there's also, I think, just with getting older, you maybe get a bit more confident and you you maybe kind of realize as well that like literally nobody cares about what you're wearing or what you're doing because everyone cares about their own lives and if anyone does really care about what you're wearing like it's it's probably a lack of their own things to be getting on with that they're concerning themselves with you i do i've always liked to experiment with styles and things but there's things that before i wouldn't have worn because i didn't want to attract attention and you know that way when you're a bit younger you just want to get your head down and get through life with as little you know you don't want to stand out or anything like that and it's but the thing is now I don't think I would stand out because I'm very aware I can wear what I want and nobody else is going to care. What I'm kind of thinking about quite specifically right now is like a lot of the sort of vintage 
style things that I bought last year. If you watched that haul last year, I bought things from a brand called Miss Candy Floss and I got some of their coats for Christmas and things. And I have always loved that vintage style and I've always kind of done nods to it within my own style. I've always been very wary of being like, oh, I don't want to look like I'm wearing a costume. So if I'm doing my hair kind of vintage, I'll wear a different kind of outfit or whatever. And I don't really want to commit to anything that's too you know, clearly evocative of an era rather than just being a nod to vintage. Whereas now I feel like I'm just like, do you know what, I really like that so I'm going to wear it and I don't care if somebody else doesn't like it. Do you know what, like, so I've kind of finally got into that place but I'm in that place now mentally where I've reached that but I'm restricted in what I can buy because I've, as a self, self-imposed restrictions by being on a no buy or a low buy. But the flip side of it as well is that, I, as I said earlier, I graduated in 2015, so then I did a graduate programme, worked my way up and whatever, and a lot of these vintage reproduction companies, the stuff is very expensive because a lot of it's made in very small batches, they're generally independent businesses, and that's great because you're supporting an independent small business. A lot of the time they're female owned, so great all round in that sense. But when you've got less disposable income, are you going to take a chance on trying something a little bit different that you think you might like, but you don't know, especially when you have to buy most of this stuff online, a lot of it you're importing, so you might get customs fees and whatever, on top of what is already an expensive item in the first place. You know, when you are first graduated or even when you are a student or whatever, you don't have the money to risk like that. Whereas now, although this year might be slightly different, but in the past few years, I've maybe been in a position where I have more money that I could take a chance on these kinds of things. And I have last year taken a chance on a few of these things, found that I really liked them and wanted more. I feel like I've kind of dipped my toe in there and got got into it and now I'm stopping it. And I, I feel like that the pull of that I think is going to challenge me. A change in work environment, meaning a change in work wear, I think will be a sort of practical challenge. But I think the real sort of pull and temptation will just be because my style has changed and evolved in the last few years. You know, I turned 30 and just in a slightly different place for being somebody who was last freely shopping for clothes four years ago. Like that doesn't sound like that much time, but actually if you're looking at somebody being in their mid twenties through to being in their early thirties, that's quite a big span of time and it's quite a big change of life in a lot of ways. I feel like that sounds really overdramatic, but hopefully some of you will know what I'm kind of getting at. But I do think that will be my other kind of big challenge for this year. So when I am faced with those challenges, I have to connect with my why. So that brings me on to having reflected on all those previous years and what I've learned from them and how it's prepared me for this year. What is my big why for doing a no buy year in 2023? So the big why for 2023, which makes this year different to any other year, as I'm sure you have guessed from a few of the things I've said in this video, is financial. This year I am in a slightly different financial position to how I have been in the past because there is a cost of living crisis. So my bills are going up just like everybody else's. That means as a percentage of my income my bills are taking up more and leaving me with less disposable income. So first and foremost I have less disposable income to spend. For the past three years alongside my no buy year in 2020, my low buy in 2021 and my no buy last year I have attempted to run a budgeting project. But as I said earlier in the video, I am not good at moderation and I have massively failed at the budgeting project every single year. I am going to do the budget again this year. So my next video after this, I think will be outlining exactly what the rules of my no buy for this year will be and what that will cover and what that will pertain to. And then I will have my budget, which will be things that I am allowed to spend money on, but I want to moderate what I'm spending on. So things like eating out, whatever, that video will be coming and I will outline my budget with you and what it covers. But I have attempted to do a budget for the last three years and I have failed every year. I cannot seem to get my head around budgeting and I have to get my head around budgeting because for the past three years, I have been slowly taking money out of my holiday savings account. Thankfully, I've not yet started taking money out of my actual savings account or my house savings account. So like, I've not started touching that, but I have got very into the habit of skimming off of my holiday savings account because travel stopped for the last like 
2020 and 2021, yes, 2022 was actually when I really started to think this is a bit of an issue because I started travelling again in 2022 but I didn't even do any big holidays. Travel has increased in price so I'm not going to be able to go on the kind of holidays that I was going on at the same kind of prices that I was getting them for pre-Covid. So even just like basic travel has increased in price and I have booked a big holiday for near the end of this year I'm going to Canada and Alaska and I'm really excited about that holiday and as I say I know in the middle of a cost of living crisis there will be people who aren't even getting holidays this year so I know I'm really lucky that even going in that holiday is an option for me this year but it's only an option if I stop skimming off of my holiday savings account because I'm going over the budget that I have set myself that I want to be spending month on month on certain things like socialising etc, getting my hair done, getting my nails done, all of that kind of stuff. So I need the budget to take my energy this year because I need to master the budget. Because if I don't master the budget, I ain't getting on holiday. I know that's very much a privileged problem, but that that is step one. However, step two, I want to be putting more money into my savings account for my house savings account. So I want to actually be Whilst I'm watching my bills increase, I also would like to be increasing the amount that I'm putting to saving each month for my actual house. And I've got really big decisions. We are in a cost of living crisis. We are heading from what I can understand from the news. I'm not a financial whiz, so don't take your financial advice from me, obviously. But from what I understand, we're heading like we're in a worldwide recession and it's not going to give up any time soon. So I don't think I'll be buying a house this year. However, it's something I want to do in the future, hopefully in the reasonably near future, not like in 10 years time. However, I for a very long time thought I'd be buying that house with somebody, whereas I think now I've had to accept I'm going to have to buy it as a single person, which means I need to be increasing how much I put towards saving for it. it also means I need to increase the amount of money that I need to get used to putting aside every month for bills because my bills are high enough just now, never mind if I am a single person who owns a house and has to pay all of the bills for that house, that's kind of in the future. I need to build up my financial savings pot to make that a more stomachable process. The other thing around buying a house is that it raises a lot of questions for me about where do I want to live and if I want to move that means giving up my current job. So do I also then need, on top of having a house deposit saved and money for legal fees and money to set up a house with and buy furniture with and whatever when I first buy the house, do I also need to have, you know, six months salary saved just in case I struggle to get another job in this area that I might move to? I'm not definitely saying that I am going to move out of this area altogether or move to a place where my current company doesn't have a branch and an office that I'd be able to feasibly move to, but it's an option, it's a thought, and I don't want, if I decide that is the right thing for me to move away, I don't want to be hampered from being able to make that decision because I don't have enough money in my savings. So it really is financial for me this year. I need to be saving more money than I currently save. My bills are also going up, so that means if I'm saying I have, you know, my income is X, I'm taking away my bills, I'm taking away my savings, what I'm left with is my disposable income, but both of these are going up, the disposable income's going down and down and down. So that is part of the reason that I am doing a no buy this year is because if I have failed at the budget for the last three years, I need this year to be the year that I learn to budget. So taking away the temptation of doing any spending at all on the categories that take the majority of my disposable income, taking them out of the equation altogether means that that disposable income that is left, that pays for my holidays, and it pays for my monthly budget. And it means as well, if that is a hard no on the no buy and I'm not having to overthink it, because the thing is 2021, doing a quantity controlled low buy was really good in a lot of ways. And I love what I bought and I love the decisions that I made, but the amount of energy I had to put into making those decisions, or not that I had to, but that I, I put into, that I chose to put into, making those decisions and researching the next purchase, and the way it would sort of rev up as I made the purchase, then I would kind of go through the come down and be like, oh, I can't buy anything again until next month, and then I would start to research for the next month, 
and going through like those peaks and troughs and that dip and putting that amount of energy into that no wonder I failed at the budget because all my energy was going into that and then last year a lot of my energy went into holidays and planning holiday shopping because I did manipulate the holiday shopping last year there's no two ways about it so this year I just want to take all of that so off the table that it's not taking any of my energy any of my thought process because I want to put all of my energy into learning to budget into managing to budget and I do I find budgeting hard I find moderation very very hard I much prefer a hard no to having to manage that but I can't go through life not being able to manage that so that absolutely has to be the thing that comes out of this year is I have to have saved more money and out of what I've not saved, what I've spent, what my disposable income is, has to be within the budget that I have set for myself for this year. In the last few years, if I have skimmed money off my holiday savings account because I've gone over my budget month to month, it's been an inconvenience. This year, it, yes, that would be a problem because I wouldn't be able to pay the holiday, but I also know what would happen is that if I don't have enough money in my holiday savings account, I'll lift money from my actual savings account to pay the holiday. And then, as I've just said, if I decide, actually, I want to move to a completely different part of the country and my current job doesn't operate there and I can't just get a move, so actually, do you know what? I can't move to this house that I found that I really like because I can't afford to be unemployed for three months. That is a problem. You know, I need to be in a different financial situation in terms of I need to have a far more robust savings account than I currently do to be able to make all those decisions so that financially, obviously I'm not, obviously finance will always have to be a factor in any of these decisions but I don't want it to be a restrictive factor that completely stops me doing what it is I would really like to do. So if I want to be making those big decisions in the next few years in a clear and comfortable headspace I need my savings account to be padded out and I need to be able to manage my money so much better than I currently do. Those decisions haven't really, I've kind of been thinking about buying a house for the last few years, but I was kind of thinking about it and then we had COVID. And although COVID was mainly 2020, it totally bled all over 2021. Even last year, it only very slowly felt like we were getting back to normal and things. And then now we're being hit with a recession. So it's, I've kind of thought about buying a house for the last few years and there's always been a sort of reason to put it off, but it is something that I do want to do. And because I've found reasons to put it off for the last few years, or not because I've found, I mean, I didn't find COVID. COVID came to us, unfortunately, but it did. I've not been prioritising my savings in the way that I should for the last few years. I've got lazy with it. I've got lax with it. And I need that to, I need to focus on that. If I want to have the life that I want to have overall, I need to manage my money, so I need to stop shopping. And the secondary why taps into what I've done in the last few years. I've definitely got a lot less clutter than I used to, but I've still got more than I'm comfortable with. So I still want to be stopping that inflow of things as much as possible and getting through things and moving things out and just learning to live with less and being comfortable with what I own rather than always chasing the new thing. So all of that is absolutely still on the table and still is a drive be behind this year. It's the finance thing is the main thing this year. I have goals of how much I want to save this year and I cannot hit those goals and shop. So that is why I'm on a major no buy this year. But all of the other emotional reasons do still count. Looking longer term, the thing about, as I just said, in 2021, the amount of energy that that took, going through those highs and lows of picking what to buy, buying it, coming down, then picking what to buy again, buying it and coming down, and then also how easily I accumulated a lot of stuff without ever feeling like I had bought a lot of stuff in 2022, maybe because it was on holiday, because I was stopping in between, whatever it was, at no point in 2022 did I feel like I was shopping excessively, but I still bought quite a lot of stuff. And I don't like that I managed to do that without feeling like I was doing it and without noticing. So for me, to go back to the finance thing, learning to budget, if I can learn the budget for this year, for the things that I would be spending money on that are not no-buy items, if I can learn to control and moderate, in that sense. That gives me hope that I can learn to moderate in 
the sense in the future of setting a budget to cover the items that are covered by my no buy this year and the fact I have failed at the budget every year that I've tried it leads me to believe well I'm trying not to believe it but I am I probably do subconsciously believe that I'm just not capable of budgeting so I really need to get the budget right this year to prove to myself that I can budget because if I cannot learn to budget my future basically I am always going to have to have a sort of formal project in place every year. I wouldn't even mind that to be honest as I say in terms of the replacements and my workwear specifically and wearing clothing out and not replacing it during my low buy year because it was quantity controlled I didn't replace basic boring things I kind of made it so that every one item had to be this sort of pinnacle item that was worth spending my one item for the month on but I think probably the best thing actually would have been if I could have done a budget because then I might have been like oh I'll buy one slightly nicer thing one month then the next month I'll maybe buy like you know four jumpers from Marks and Spencers that will do me for work for another little while or whatever but I was never going to give up one of my like precious quantity controlled low buy items to spend it on you know a 30 pounds Marks and Spencers jumper for work like it was never going to happen so I think like probably if if I had to face a future where I can absolutely never naturally moderate myself the best thing I think would be would be to have like a no buy year then maybe like a budget year, then maybe like a quantity controlled low buy year, then a no buy year and do it like that so that it's kind of always rotating or maybe almost like with the holidays, maybe say months that it's like you can shop in this month but then you can't shop for the next four months or whatever. I don't know, I don't know what the future holds. I would love to be somebody who naturally moderates. I don't know if that is ever going to be possible but I would really hope that it is because I feel like at the end of the day we all need stuff so it's not just about wanting stuff it is about the fact that sometimes we actually need stuff and I would like to be able to identify that I need something without replacing a pair of jeans releasing a want in me to be like oh I want to go for another hit I want to go buy another thing or looking for excuses to be able to buy things and that that looking for excuses and that fear of looking for excuses is probably why I didn't replace a lot of things as I talked about earlier and why I struggle with the idea of replacing things because it's not clear cut when it's clothing in the way that it is when it's like skincare or beauty products that have run out. I feel like this sounds, I feel like this section sounds a bit woolly and I'm not really articulating myself well but it's the emotional control that spending and shopping has on me still and it's nothing like it was when I was in the grips of really bad mental health but the thing is it became so bad when I was in bad mental health because I was already in the habit of doing it when I was well. It was already my hobby, it was already something I enjoyed, it was already something I was putting my energy into and it was it was a source of joy for me ahead of, of a really bad bout of depression that then when I was depressed it was the one thing I could connect to and find a bit of joy from but it was probably there because I had already trained my brain prior to it being in a, an unwell state. I had already trained my brain to associate buying stuff and accumulating stuff with joy. You know that those patterns were already in place so although I'm not desperately clutching at things and expecting them to change my life now in the way that I was hoping they would change my life when I was in the grips of really bad mental health. The fact that I have managed to ramp up in 2021 and 2022 in the ways that I did, particularly in 2022 without realising how much it had ramped up, just makes me feel quite vulnerable. I am in a very, very different space and I'm much, much better than I was, but it doesn't mean that I am completely free of it. So that is the kind of emotional push behind doing this no buy this year is to A, I think doing a really solid no buy like I did in 2020 where there wasn't holidays and wasn't exceptions for holidays and whatever the way that I was able to end up having in 2022 as a bit of a crutch that I probably didn't even realise was a crutch at the time I think a really solid no buy is a good way to put a good wall of distance between myself and shopping so that I can reevaluate it in the future but I also would just like to feel a bit more hopeful 
about my possible future with consumerism and my ability to control that. That goes back then to being able to budget, to proving to myself that I can budget, to proving to myself that that is a possibility for me, when right now it doesn't feel like it is. And I'm, I'm trying not to be really negative because I, you cannot, I don't think, go into a project like this feeling like you're going to fail, like you have to believe that it is possible for you to succeed. And I do, if I didn't think it was possible to succeed, I wouldn't attempt it. Do you know what? I'm not there, so I don't mean to make it sound like I'm there, but I am really, I don't have a good, I don't have a good history. I've got a proven track record of failing at the budgeting. I need this year to be the year that I learn to budget because if I cannot learn to budget, I have no hope of going on in life and not having to always be in some kind of controlled project regarding my consumerism. The thing is, I think everyone's in a controlled pro- everyone who shops normally is in a controlled project because they are looking at their budget but they're not thinking about it as like, this is my budget and I'm going to track what's in my budget. They're just doing it naturally because they're good with money and they're not emotionally gripped by stuff in the way that I sometimes find myself becoming. Need to be hopeful about the fact that that could be my future and I think the step towards that is managing the budget so if I can go on the no buy so that I can manage the budget, A it means I can increase my savings because I stop spending on the stuff that's covered by no buy so that can go to my savings. If I manage the budget I don't skim back off of my savings and I can then take the budget management forward and that opens up just a bit more sort of emotional stability about how I will feel about my relationship with stuff and with consumerism. So those are my big whys for 2023. Thank you so much if you've watched this point of this video. This is so long, I don't even know, It's. I think I filmed for about three hours so I honestly don't even know how it's going to end up, what it's going to end up at, but thank you so much if you've watched through to the end and my next one should be me outlining exactly what the rules are for my 2023 no buy year. So I will see you in that one.